Uh, this webinar is about teaching for global competence uh, using global thinking routines. And I'm just going to share a little bit uh, about my interest in that topic. So my interest really began when I was an ESOL teacher for 10 years in an urban public school system and saw uh, how important it was for myself and for other teachers to understand the backgrounds, cultural and linguistic backgrounds and experiences and points of view and ways of communicating funds of knowledge of immigrant and refugee adolescent students uh, really from all over the world. As I shifted into uh, teacher education in 2012, I, uh, my focus has been on preparing teachers, both in-service and pre-service teachers for teaching culturally and linguistically diverse learners with equity and excellence. And so as part of my own uh, growing as a scholar and teacher educator, I have learned a lot about teaching for global competence and it kind of uh, started as a journey that was afforded to me through the Center for International Education at Mason through a little scholarship called Open Gate Global Awareness and Teacher Education. And I made a journey to Norway in 2017 and met uh, the most wonderful colleague her name is Dr. Kristen Skinstad van der Koich, and she is a professor in critical multicultural education. And we discovered this real love of history, of critical pedagogy, and of serving immigrants and refugee students that we had in common. So that was kind of the catalyst for wanting to learn more. And I began to read the literature around teaching for global competence, sometimes called uh, cosmopolitan education, sometimes called global citizenship education. So there are different uh, names for it really in the in the uh, literature about it. And from there, I applied to be a global teacher ed fellow and I was selected in 2018 and 19, along with seven, uh, well, there were seven total, six other people, uh, teacher education scholars in the nation who are interested in embedding teaching for global competence in teacher education. So that's really uh, how I came to learn and am still learning um, about this topic. And that's the kind of the basis for what I'm going to share with you tonight. Uh, so it would be great if we could know a little bit about your background. Chanel is going to uh, release a poll so we can uh, just gather a little bit of information about the participants. Just curious to know your teaching background, if you're an in-service teacher, how long you've been teaching, where you're located, okay. Okay, looks like Mostly everybody is an in-service teacher and many uh, very experienced teachers. Which is fantastic. Um, it shows how what true believers we are in lifelong learning as educators. Great. Just going to scroll down there. Okay, almost everybody is from Virginia. And most people are just learning about teaching for global competence. Yeah, preparing children to be global citizens, that's the goal. Okay, thank you all, that's great. I think Chanel, we can close out the, the poll there. Thanks everybody for participating in that sharing a little bit about yourselves. Uh, so in this session, we are going to explore what teaching for global competence means and why it matters. We're going to look at some specific global thinking routines that can be used in pre-K to 12 classrooms across content areas. 
we're going to try out uh, briefly two global thinking routines and then invite you to share your ideas for integrating global thinking routines into your curricula. I do want to just say there that this is not the only way to teach for global competence. It's based on a specific framework uh, that I'm going to share with you tonight, but there are other frameworks, okay? And I'm going to share some links and articles so that you can learn more uh, about this topic. So simply from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development and the Asia Society for International Education have worked together along with uh, teachers in schools across many years to develop a working definition of global competence that is quite straightforward and brief. And that is the capacity and disposition to understand and act on issues of global significance. In that framework, and I will share uh, the link to this actual uh, document, you can, it's a downloadable PDF that you can uh, read. It's very, very friendly with clear illustrations about these four domains of global competence. So they are investigate the world, recognize perspectives, communicate ideas, and take action. Okay. So unpacking those a little bit, uh, to the left, you can see the visual of that's the actual document that was released in 2019, I believe, Teaching for Global Competence in a Rapidly Changing World. So that's a great tool to download and read at your leisure and uh, use to inform your own practice. But those four domains of global competence can really be thought about as dispositions that we want uh, children to develop and that we want to develop ourselves as educators. So we, we can use uh, a global competence frameworks and teach for global competence to develop the children's dispositions to examine issues of local, global, and cultural significance beyond their immediate environment. And so we know that many children don't get a chance to examine things beyond their immediate environment we can invite them to do that. We can develop their disposition to understand and appreciate the perspectives and views of others. We can cultivate the disposition to engage in open, appropriate and effective interaction across cultures with diverse audiences and cultivate the disposition to take action for collective well-being and sustainable development, both locally and globally. Okay, so that unpacks those four domains a little bit. And in that PDF, there's great explanations and classroom examples as well. I just wanted to share also that I think teaching for global competence uh, aligns well with many school districts, 21st century portraits of a graduate. And that includes fostering children's capacity to be global citizens, right? So this one is just right from Fairfax Public Schools, uh, Fairfax County Public Schools website. And you can see that this also aligns, teaching for global competence aligns with 21st century skills that we are all working hard to uh, cultivate in children as well, okay? So with ethical and global citizen and being, I think all of those other ones tie into being a, a, a global citizen, okay? I'm gonna take just a pause there to just invite you to one more poll. I'm curious to know uh, how much your school district emphasizes teaching children about global competence. And if you've had professional development on this topic or intercultural competence and how important you think it is. We'll just pause a few moments. Okay, so interestingly there, um, not surprisingly, there's still a low level in some districts, but others moderate level and high. People have had some professional development on this topic, some not at all, a few people a lot, and yet we consider it really important, right? Okay, great, thank you.
we can end that polling, uh, Chanel. Okay, let me go on then. Thank you for sharing that. It's nice to learn a little bit more about you, even though I can't see you. Uh, so we, you know, when we think about the relevance for teaching for global competence or why it matters, we know uh, we can just think about the reality of the world in which we live, right? So we have people moving all around the world. It's possible to uh, even people from here in the United States who go to live abroad in other countries and certainly those who come here as well as those who uh, voluntarily come, but along with those who are involuntarily displaced, such as refugees who are uprooting their lives to other countries, perhaps never to return to their own, right? We can see um, just in the, the news around us, in our own context, in our own country, how important it is that we, we grow or foster children who can understand and appreciate and respect similarities and differences across racial, ethnic, gender groups, religious groups, sexual orientation, right? That there's so much diversity um, that we have to be respectful and not judgmental of what other people think and communicate with one another in respectful ways. Help students to understand that their cultural identities really are hybrid and they're dynamic and they're fluid. Right, so students may uh, belong to, and as they grow into adults, they may belong to religious groups. They may belong. They may be politically affiliated um, in a in a certain way. They may belong to community groups, local organizations, uh, professional groups, and all of those identities intersect. So they can have local, community, state, national identities, but we also are all citizens of this world. So we all have that global citizen identity too. And we know that uh, today's children are the ones who are going to grow to create a more just and sustainable world, we hope, right? We've given them a hard job uh, to, we've handed them a hard, a hard job at this moment in history. Um, but that is part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals also the creation of a more just and sustainable world. Um, so there's a question that are we going to email the slides? Yes, we are. Yes, Chanel is going to email the PowerPoint with all the links um, at the end. Okay. Global citizenship or global competence requires intercultural competence. So it's kind of connected to that theme as well. And intercultural competence, is, the features of that are being open-minded and genuinely interested in other cultures noticing and being knowledgeable about cultures, differences and similarities, uh, being able to resist stereotypes and to anticipate that there will be complexities when we communicate and interact and live and work with people who are from different cultural groups than ourselves. And the willingness to modify our behavior to say, hey, I need to be able to communicate and act um, and to receive others' behavior and communication in a different way if I have a level of intercultural competence. So one of my uh, favorite phrases that I've come across is that intercultural competence and global competence are really a mindset, a heart set, and a skill set, right? So we have to put our mind and our hearts in the game and then learn how we can cultivate uh, these dispositions in children in our teaching. So our focus tonight is specifically on just one way to do that, and that is through global thinking routines. And these were developed, you can see the link at the bottom, out of uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education, a project called Project Zero that has been going on for quite some time. So really they're micro teaching tools that can be used to nurture those global dispositions, inquiring about the world, seeking multiple perspectives, engaging in respectful dialogue and taking responsible action that are the four domains of global competence in this framework. And they can uh, help us to create a culture of global competence in our classrooms throughout the school year. 
basically we use the global thinking routine starting with a, a provocation something that we could say the old um, term anticipatory set or something that's a hook right something that gets children interested it can be print based it can be digital it can be from children's literature it can be artwork photos realia other visuals that we can use uh, to start some deep and critical and reflective thinking and sharing in our classrooms, okay? Of course, we wanna connect it to the curriculum. Uh, we know that we have a fast paced curricula. Oftentimes we have to keep up the um, scope and sequence, the pacing of, of what we need to teach, the content that we need to share with children. So, this is, I share with teachers that this is really about looking for those spaces where we can cultivate a global competence within our existing curricula, okay? So interdisciplinary connections and project-based learning are great ways to do that. The five uh, global thinking routines, and by the way, on the previous slide, uh, on this slide, the global thinking icon you see in the bottom, that is also a downloadable PDF that unpacks these five uh, global thinking routines nicely for you. So these are five that we're going to just talk about briefly and then uh, practice two, okay? Three whys, beauty and truth, step in, step out, step back, circles of action and how else and why. As I said at the beginning, my, my examples are based on uh, the topic of inclusion versus exclusion of immigrants and refugees based on the work that I did with my colleague in Norway. And as a global teacher education fellow, I redesigned one of the courses that I teach, Intro to Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Learners. And I built in five modules that are centered around some deep learning about teaching for global competence. So that's where my provocations and examples come from. But it can it can be used, the three whys can be used for a broad all of the all of the um, global thinking routines can be used for a broad range of topics, right? So they can be in science and mathematics and music and art and social studies and language arts and any in any content area, okay? So we just invite students to find those spaces, make those local and global connections and ask why might a certain topic matter to me? So it can be something like why, why might the fact that invasive plant species um, have appeared in our environment? Or why might the fact that plants that once were more south are appearing more north matter to me? Why might that matter to people around me? Why might it matter to the world? Why might it matter that we have um, wildfires in California? Why would that matter to me locally and to the people around me and to my state and to my nation? And why would it matter to the world? And that gives us a way to dig into uh, what is really going on uh, with those kinds of issues and how they really just don't impact the people in California, but have broader implications. Okay, so really can be, uh, I did one of these with a picture of a, a really skinny looking polar bear on a piece of ice floating in the Arctic Ocean. And just thinking about, you know, why, why would it matter that this polar bear doesn't seem to have enough food or seems to be struggling to stay on this small piece of ice. Why, why would that matter in my local community or to the people around me, okay? Yes, you can also apply to math. You just have to do, uh, you know, do some thinking about that. And I think that's where interdisciplinary work uh, comes into play, right? Where math would be involved. And I'll show you one example of that. The next global thinking routine in that packet of global thinking routines on the Project Zero website is beauty and truth. So here we just try to engage um, students in considering their common human experience and to be critical consumers of the world news or images that we see. So part of 21st century skill is also media literacy and critical media literacy, right? So that we are bombarded by images. And sometimes we need to look behind the layers of the images. So here we see uh, a beautiful group of young kids that look you know, quite happy to be outside in the breeze and having a good time. Uh, but when we think about what might be behind the story, then this, this 
global thinking routine gives us a way to build that discussion. Okay. Another one is called step in, step out, step back. And this one is about perspective taking, also can be used with a broad range of topics. Okay. So in this one, um, in my class that I teach, uh, these are two little girls from Honduras who are uh, US citizens as they were born here, but their parents are undocumented. And they live like millions of other families in our country in a mixed status home where the parents are undocumented, but the children are US citizens. So in Step In, Step Out, Step Back, we consider how these young girls might be feeling. Uh, what do you think their experience is? And then what would you need to know to really understand better their perspective and what's going on? So then we read a news story from the Los Angeles Times uh, that showed how their, their parents had really, you know, been here 20 years and had um, bought a house and had jobs and uh, were contributing to their communities. And yet uh, their daughters and themselves lived in fear every day that they were going to go home and their parents weren't going to be there um, anymore. Uh, so this was kind of an eye opener, even for many um, practicing teachers who thought, you know, I just, I think I teach children in that situation, but I really haven't had time to, uh, haven't had time to really think about that or respond to that or have any discussion about it. Yeah, I think um, Holly is saying it would be great to use in social skills. I agree. So when you step back, then you are, um, you are also reflecting on your own ability to take somebody else's perspective and how you might have learned about yourself and maybe even shifted your viewpoint. Or if you didn't shift your viewpoint, just said, wow, you know, I just never really considered that issue from that person's point of view before. Um, Dr. Ramos, before yes. um, we move to the next uh, routine, there was a question, how can you help support these students with that fear? Um, I think that you addressed in your previous routine. Yeah. Um, so it is a little bit tricky, right? And I'll go back to my own ESOL teaching experience to answer that question. So I want to start by saying we know that actually uh, it's important that we don't inquire about legal status as teachers or as public school um, systems, right? It actually in Plyler versus Doe 1982, we're prohibited from doing that. At the same time, uh, in my experience, many students, and I taught adolescent learners, so that may be a little different, and their parents shared that with me, okay? So I think uh, one thing that you can do is just to be empathetic to it, right? To when it is uh, told to you, to recognize it, to just kind of uh, find ways to bring up that we all have a different story of being here in this classroom together in this place, we are, we are safe. Um, we, we come from different backgrounds and we, you know, perhaps in a unit of exploring how people came to the United States, both voluntarily and involuntarily in our history and just kind of thinking about, you know, what that feels like and how people might uh, work through those fears by talking with someone or just using our own teacher sense, right, to, to think about um, when we do know that's a child's circumstance, how we might just offer comfort and security and safety um, to that child, I think is, is important. So the last one that we're going to talk, or the second to the last, is circles of action. And again, it's kind of similar to the three whys, but it actually invites us to think about how we might uh, take some action, right? Or why it would be important to do so. Uh, so for example, we can use water rights and perhaps in a unit learn that there are many uh, people in the world, including here in the United States who don't have access to clean water. And why might it be important then for us? So we have to make these age appropriate and grade appropriate, right? To conserve water, to take care of um, keeping water clean. How do we do that if we're in second grade or if we're in 11th grade, right? How, uh, how, how might I contribute to this idea of 
water protection and water rights for all. And uh, are there things that I can do that actually do affect people in other parts of the world that don't have enough water, okay? So we can just kind of think about, it can be any issue uh, that we might want to focus on how we can contribute in our ourselves, in our community and beyond our in immediate environment. And the last one uh, that we're going to talk about tonight is how else and why. This one I think is very uh, important in one of the, the short uh, articles from Ed Leadership that Chanel is going to share with you along with the PowerPoint after this webinar. There's a great example of a seventh grade classroom where uh, there is a discussion about uh, the border and children who feel that uh, the border should be strongly policed and no one should come across that border. And other children in the room who have come across the border. And so uh, this one is just, you know, really the teacher does a nice job of inviting students to think about and not just once. So where throughout the school year might it be useful to say, you know, we have, we, we have some strong opinions about this and we see them all around us uh, from our parents and in the news. And so how might we, how might we say our opinion thinking about the other people that we're talking to and what their experiences might be and what their perspectives might be how might I use language as a powerful and respectful tool to say what I want to say um, in a different way, right? So this one is, is called, how, how else can I say this and why? Yeah, it is perfect for the virtual environment. I agree. It's a good, a good tool uh, as sometimes when we're you know, typing and in, in graduate coursework on discussion board, uh, we may, we may not mean a certain tone, but we maybe the reader reads a certain tone. So it is important to ask ourselves how we can carefully say what we want to say in a respectful way. Okay, so I wanna take um, just a quick pause there and we're going to just do a quick practice of beauty and truth. We can't really take as much time as we would if this were a graduate course, we would devote some time to this. We're just gonna take a few moments, okay? But I do want you to just get the feel for what it is like to engage in one of the beauty and one of the global thinking routines, okay? So in this one, uh, I will give you just a tiny bit of, the tiniest bit of background. So these are Syrian children. Um, if you are aware of what, you know, has been going on for quite some time now in Syria, where people who had um, everyday lives like ours, people who were shopkeepers and lawyers and engineers and any, anything, um, mechanics and had apartments and their children went to school every day and they had a, a complete way of life going on and suddenly they had to uh, flee, right? And have not been able to return and are all over the world. Um, I believe, if I'm recalling correctly, these children are in a refugee camp in Turkey, which actually uh, took nearly 3 million Syrian refugees, okay? So they're outside and they're playing um, outside in some lot in the refugee camp where they live. And I just want you to take a few moments to think about, invite you, not everybody has to do it, but if you, if you wanna um, type in the chat box, if you can find beauty in this image, if you can find truth in this image, and how might beauty reveal truth, and how might beauty conceal truth? Mm -hmm. Right, children being children, but there's the refugee camp in the background. Open arm joy. Mm -hmm. There's beauty in their smiles. They do look like they're having fun being together. Mm -hmm. Yes, the ground is bare. Mm -hmm. Beauty in their smiles and truth in their situation. Mm -hmm. So what do we think about how might beauty conceal truth? What might, what could be the truth behind the beauty? Mm -hmm. 
Happiness on their face can hide the truth. Beauty and color of outfits, truth in their smiles. Mm -hmm. The hidden is how they live, right? Yes. Unaware of the dangers of their lives. Mm -hmm. Right. Their smiles might not show their daily difficulties. They are dealing with a lot of uncertainty, although they look happy. We don't know if their needs are being met. Mm -hmm. They don't have enough, but they have each other. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so I kind of, I think you get the idea. Of course, if you were in a classroom, you would give a lot more time for uh, students to respond and you may do some background building, some other activities before you, before you engage in this, perhaps reading a story. Uh, there's some beautiful children's literature now about uh, refugee families and children's experiences, right? Yes, they really do. Uh, they really do look tiny, don't they? Like perhaps not getting enough to eat, losing connection to their home country. So in my course, um, I share some videos actually of uh, the children, some of the, not maybe not these exact children, but Syrian refugee children talking and the, uh, you know, the trauma that they have witnessed is just um, pretty horrific, really. And just, you know, not knowing, wanting to go back to their school, not knowing if they're ever going to go home to their country. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for participating in that. I'm going to give us an opportunity to practice uh, one more. Um, so we'll just practice the three whys uh, about why it might be important to welcome refugee families. Why does that matter to me? Uh, why might it matter in my immediate environment, my family, friends, my community? Um, and why might that matter in the world? So to share a little bit of, of, of background there, um, we have now 65 million refugees in the world. And I think um, if, I'm, if I'm correct, in last year, the United States took about 18,000 refugees. We compared that to Turkey um, hosting 2.5 million Syrian refugees. Uh, I have learned in Virginia that Northern Virginia Family Services, Virginia Refugee Student uh, Academic support program. There's lots of programs and lots of refugee families uh, here in our communities and also in our classrooms. Okay, so if you just want to take a moment and answer the three whys in the chat box, if you feel inclined to do so, we'll practice one more. Yes, we never do know, right? We could one day be a refugee and want to be taken in. I've thought about refugees a lot during this pandem pandemic and how it feels to be so isolated and not be able to do what we want to do and kind of feel guilty sometimes because I feel, you know, sorry for <laughs> myself or what we are enduring and yet it doesn't compare to what others are enduring. Mm -hmm. Accepting all and showing kindness to all people. Mm -hmm. That's a very beautiful example of how personally uh, it matters, right? Mm -hmm. Enrich our own lives and expand our own cultural bubbles. Teaching tolerance. Mm -hmm. Yes, their stories are important to tell. Make them part of the community in our classrooms and in the broader community as well, right? Yes, it's culturally responsive to care and have empathy for uh, refugee families who are, who are living in our communities and whose children are filling our classrooms. Mm -hmm. Right. The world needs to be a safe place. Mm -hmm. I, it reminds me of um, when I was in Norway, one saying that uh, 
Kristen Skinstad shared with me uh, from a Norwegian defender of refugees and actually they rewrote their constitution uh, quite some time ago, but the phrase that freedom is hospitable was um, an inspiration in that nation. Yes, we experience similar emotions, even if for different reasons. Equality and equity for all people. It's a world problem, right? With 65 million refugees currently, it's a very much a world problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much. Yes, it's so difficult. Yeah, we think, you know, we all, we do share this common humanity, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Um, so I just kind of want to recap because we're coming, we still have a little bit of time, but I want to make sure we save time for some questions. So I want to emphasize that uh, this is from another uh, perspective that outlined the signature, signature pedagogies of globally competent teachers that kind of aligns with the framework that I shared with you already this evening, right? That it really is just about an intentional effort to integrate global topics and include multiple, multiple perspectives into and across the curriculum throughout the school year, right? Just to include uh, ongoing and authentic engagement with issues of global significance and connecting your own global experiences, whether they have been actual and physical or through learning uh, about other places in the world and what is going on in, on so many levels in the world around us and connecting that with students' experiences and the curriculum, okay? Uh, reiterating that this really is a, a theoretical proposition coming from the theory of thinking dispositions that we can, we should as teachers uh, accept our responsibility to invite children to think critically, reflectively, and deeply, right? I know from being a teacher myself uh, for 20 years, I taught Spanish 10 years before I taught ESOL for 10 years. And in these last eight years as a teacher educator, uh, we, we are often faced with having children learn a lot of things about a lot of topics, but not deeply about them, right? So any opportunity that we can engage in critical pedagogy to help them think um, analytically, to think deeply and to be able to rationalize and justify and explain and consider other viewpoints and layers behind uh, what we are learning in textbooks or uh, through other sources, right? That we, we really do need to be collaborative, communicative, creative, critical thinkers to uh, be able to improve the world and improve our own lives as well, okay? So it's really about cultivating those kinds of dispositions. You'll see on the website um, that I've shared uh, with you from the Asia Society uh, that teaching for global competence really is accessible and practical approach. Any teacher can use it in any classroom, okay? Um, it's about really valuing the idea and building in dispositions are, are grow, right? They need to be nurtured and um, coaxed to, to grow and to build, right? They don't just automatically happen. Um, so it does not, it doesn't require a new curriculum as we often, we don't have that freedom, right? It just requires us to be creative and think about the ways that we can uh, find those spaces to include teaching for global competence in our teaching and in the documents that I've shared that will be shared with you in the links, you will see that there are other ways beyond the global thinking routines. That's just one tool. Okay, you can have structured debates, um, organized discussions, uh, play-based learning, service learning, project-based learning, 
and any other endless ideas that we might come up with um, as teachers ourselves. So I wanted to just share this one example that I think could be um, connected to math and science and language arts and social studies, uh, perhaps even to art class. So one of my students developed uh, an idea that she would use visuals, videos, and three whys to invite second graders to compare the way that garbage is collected and disposed of in the US and in Nicaragua. And she had a connection to Nicaragua having spent some time there and learned how um, some children are spending their lives as scavengers really in garbage dumps, trying to find things that are sellable uh, to help sustain their families. And she felt that this could be uh, connected to issues such as poverty and health and climate change and immigration in an interdisciplinary way. And lastly, to wrap up, I just wanted to share a little bit of what my own graduate students um, have said about what they've learned about themselves through the, it really is five, five weeks, five modules that we spend on teaching for global competence. And uh, I'm not going to read it for you, just gonna kind of let you absorb it there yourself. But I like the, in the purple text uh, uh, that this student noted that, you know, it's really a choice. It's a choice of, there's a lot heaped on our teacher plates all the time, every day, right? So it's a, it's a way of saying, yes, I'm going to commit to learning more about this and integrating this into my teaching where I find the spaces to do so with the children and learners who are in front of me, okay? Um, another student said, you know, I think I missed some opportunities. I, I didn't realize that I could find so many ways to tap into local and global issues. Um, uh, but this teaching for global competence and learning about it helped me to help me to see that. And another person who said, you know, I also learned that doesn't quite feel natural yet. That I have to go back in and I have to really think about those global thinking routines and the other tools that are available. You'll find uh, one tool is called I can statements. So they're, per they're performance uh, I can statements from K to 12, really, I think pre K to 12 that are connected to those four domains of global competence that really give some great ideas. And it's also a downloadable PDF uh, for how you might couch this kind of learning as learning objectives in ICANN statements um, in your classroom connected to your curricula, okay? So um, we're going to just give you a moment to think about how you might use uh, global thinking routines in your teaching. I know it's you know getting a little late in the evening, but just a general brainstorm and we're going to use a, a new tech tool that I learned um, recently, which is a Wakelet. I don't know if any of you have used uh, Wakelet, but when uh, Chanel has put the link in the chat box for you. Okay, so when we go to that link, I have to stop sharing my screen and then share my screen in a different way. Okay. I think um, you will be able to see the whiteboard. Are you seeing it, um, Chanel? Sorry, I was still muted. Um, so I still okay. see the collection on my end. Okay. Let me try. Okay, so there's a whiteboard. Let me try. Okay, there, it looks like it's popping up on your screen. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, we tried this out uh, beforehand. So uh, if you have access through the link, then you can click on my directions are not exactly right. You need to click on the green box that says the rectangle that says edit collection first, and then you'll see um, a plus sign that you can click on and add text and share an idea 
for how you might uh, use global thinking routines, what might be a topic, an issue of global significance, a space in your, your curricula that you think you could teach for global competence, that there's a particular uh, global thinking routine that kind of sticks out that might be useful to you. So I see people are adding, um, but I don't see what they added. I'm gonna refresh my screen again. We'll give it a try for a few moments here and see if we can see what others are contributing. Okay, so collect these routines and begin exploring how to integrate them. Use beauty and truth to encourage students to look at photos. Uh-huh. In media one, said Laura. Yeah, they are great routines. We'll give just a few moments if anybody else wants to contribute. It does take a while to absorb. So I invite you to um, explore the links that are going to be shared with you. Um, so you can, you know, take time to digest the global thinking routines and read how other teachers have used them and how you might use them yourselves. So we better pause there. I think um, I'm going to stop sharing that now so that we have a little time for questions and answers. Okay, so I think I have to go back to sharing my PowerPoint so that I can see the chat box. Okay. Whoop. Ah, I accidentally clicked on the link again. I did not wish to do that. I'm afraid if I click on the X, I'm going to X myself out. So I don't know if Chanel, if you can. Yeah, uh, I get. I get any I, questions that there are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, I have a couple saved. I had a comment from the beginning of the presentation. Okay. That said, it is, it is difficult. The exponential development of technology and the variant cultural norms. So you did comment on that earlier. Um, do you have any other thoughts about ways to um, what's the word I want to use? Uh, be mindful of that as you're thinking of. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, uh, um, I would be happy to think about that a bit, Enrique. I see Enrique ask that question and, uh, you know, maybe share an answer. Uh, I would agree <laughs> that the way that we use technology, of course, would be would be influenced by our own cultures and styles of communication and expectations for the ways people are supposed to communicate uh, and supposed to being, you know, from my own cultural lens and positionality and perspective. That's an important thing to always recognize in the classroom that we are we are viewing the world and the way that people go about in the world from our own cultural lens. And so realizing that other people approach everything differently than we do, um, I think would apply to technology too. Mm -hmm. Any okay. other questions? We did. Um, so we got a question, will we get a copy of the slides and where can we purchase the book? And then a follow up to that, is are there more classes on this subject at Mason? Okay, um, so this the book is really a downloadable PDF, and it's on it's on the website that will be shared with you. Uh, you'll see the PowerPoint slides. The link is right on there, and it's also on the last page of the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, well, there, this theme of teaching for global competence, I think, is one that, at least in the program that I teach in, teaching 
culturally, linguistically diverse and exceptional learners um, is a theme that is interwoven throughout our courses. Uh, but most especially, it, there are five weeks devoted to it in the core course in our um, master's degree program in all of world language or ESOL, uh, any international elementary ed. This is, it, it's in a core course in our master's program. I don't know if there are others. We received a question in the uh, chat. How can we increase empathy in our community to help people appreciate immigrants? There are definitely some obstacles given the current political climate. Mm -hmm. Yep, so I think, you know, that's a, I, I was talking about this via discussion board actually with a graduate student just um, this past semester. And she said that uh, she feels so challenged to talk with people who don't agree with her. And I think that a lot of us, if we are being honest, uh, have that challenge, right? Whatever our beliefs are, um, it's difficult to talk with people we do, who we don't agree with. So really, I think um, just being able to commit to learning how to do that, maybe just thinking about how else and why. How else can I say what I think without being disrespectful to what you think, right? How else might I choose my words uh, to say what I want to say and to explain um, my own perspective or to invite thinking about another perspective? We can't really change another person's heart or mind uh, very easily, but I feel like now more than ever, if we uh, don't try to engage in those conversations, it's so easy to talk with people with whom we agree. It's much more challenging to talk with people uh, with whom we don't agree. And I, that's where I think, you know, there is urgency about teaching for global competence because maybe if children practice that kind of communication throughout their school lives in all their classrooms, here and there, where it makes sense, where it fits in the curriculum, um, they learn how to engage in respectful dialogue that allows a space for other perspectives and actually sparks their curiosity to think maybe there is another perspective because I've learned so many times that there were perspectives that I never thought of before. And I've discovered that there, there are people think differently about things. So as a, you know, a critical thinker, I can be a person who can look more deeply and consider what other people think if, if that helps, uh, I think it's a good place to start, to just learn to talk with others with whom uh, we don't always agree. Anything else? Any other questions? That's a good question though, and a big challenge. Yeah, not that I see. I do see a comment. I think it was in reference to, the comment is um, about a student telling a teacher information. Um, so let me see, I'm not sure if I'm missing anything. Is it in the chat box or? This one was in the Q and A, it was a comment oh. that said, I didn't inquire, this student told me. I think it was in reference to- Oh yeah, to their, their status. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so yeah, that often happens, right? It's just important that we don't ask, but then many times uh, children and their families will tell us. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other questions yet. Okay. Uh, well, I hope that uh, you enjoyed the presentation. And again, I just uh, want to honor you for being educators who would take an hour out of a long week um, to come together to talk with others and to learn more. Uh, Chanel will send you the PowerPoint with all of the links. And I appreciate really uh, your time and your willingness to participate and your contributions.